Good morning, and welcome to worship at Epworth. Um, my name is Amber Cloud. I'm the youth director here, and I'm so glad for us to be joining together in worship, um, both in person and online. And if you're online and would like to leave a prayer request in the comments, we'll pray for it later on in the service. And if you're in service, on the back of your attendance cards, there's a section where you can um, put your prayer request in. And if you would like it to be public, it'll be added to the prayer list. And if not, it'll be prayed for by the staff. Um, but one thing we like to do as a church is to celebrate milestones together. Um, some of those things being birthdays and anniversaries. Um, and so the birthdays that we have this week, today is Rick O'Brien's birthday. Um, we have Elizabeth Chancery's birthday on the 12th. And then Lynn Kwan is also on the 12th. Is there anybody else that has a birthday this week? No? And are there any anniversaries this week? Also no. Well, happy birthday to those people. Um, so we have lots of things going on in the bulletin. Um, some of the things, um, next week after service, we'll have a picnic at Optimus Park. Um, if you want to grab your lunch or bring your lunch, um, and we'll just hang out at Optimus Park for a little bit. Um, and then um, we also have a Wednesday bread break um, on July the 20th, and there are details for that in the bulletin. Um, and it says there's a sign-up sheet in the Narthex, and I don't think there is. There might be. Um, but if you w let the church office know if you want to come, we'll have a sign-up sheet next week for sure. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is the shoe boxes. Um, UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief in Decatur, um, does shoe boxes that they send out to um, other countries for Christmas. Um, and there is down in one of the Sunday school classrooms um, across from the children's room, there is set up um, a bunch of two tables worth of like toys and um, clothing and shoes. So if you want to grab a box and go down there and fill it, you're welcome to, that, to do that. The youth help organize stuff this morning during Sunday school. Um, so it is pretty well laid out. Um, but as if you want to take a box and go buy stuff, you're welcome to do that. If you have extra things left over, um, take it down to that classroom and leave it in there. And, or if you're missing a couple things out of your box, check that room and see if there's anything else. Um, but those are due, I want to say, the first week of August. Yes? Okay. Um, those are due back the first week of August. Um, so if you would like to stand and greet one another. This morning, Eric is in the back on the sound booth. Um, so if you know the song, sing extra loud. Um, but we're going to turn to hymn number 57, O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Join me as we affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he ascended, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can anyone enter a second time into a mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the, enter the kingdom of God without being born of, the water and, of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. The word of God for the people of God. God. And now if the children would like to come forward with me. Good morning. When you celebrate your birthday, do you have a cake? Yeah. And how many candles do you put on that cake? Vivian, you put five candles on your cake? Not yet. How many candles do you put on your cake? Ten? Why do you put ten on your cake, Abby? You put however many years you are, don't you? So when we have a birthday party, we think about blowing out the candles, and we put the same number of candles that we are that, that we are that many years old. And every year, we, we, we don't just celebrate the first year of our life. We keep adding a candle each time. How many candles do you think are on my cake? Ten? Vivian says five? Twenty-four. You're very close. Twenty-five, yeah. Um, I was a lot better than I anticipated. I really thought y'all were going to say like a (laughs) hundred. So today's scripture introduces a man named Nicodemus, and Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born again. And Nicodemus is confused, and he thought that Jesus was talking about about being born again the same way that he was the first time. Um, But Jesus is talking about a new kind of birth, a type of birth that was talking about God's spirit that gives giving us a birth. And so when you're born in the spirit, you are born into a whole new way of life. And are there certain, so are there certain things on your birthday that are done each year to show that you're a year older? What is it? You go to Waffle House every year? So one thing that my family did was we marked in our old house, we used to do it on the wall of our old house, and then we moved, and we had a stick, and we would mark how tall my brother and I were each year to show our growth. And so it would show how much we had grown each year, 
um, and we could check it each time to see how much we'd grown. And it was always, my brother was always way taller than me. So I never, you know, I was, when I was like 15, I was as tall as he was when he was 12. So it never really worked out for me. Um, but we could always see how much we had grown. And now we don't have that same thing in our, like, to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. But we can always look back and see um, and trust that God is filling us with love and joy. Um, and so Nicodemus wanted to be born again in this way. And so we, as we walk through our Christian faith, we also ask to be born again in this way. So <laughs> are you all ready to pray? God, sometimes it's hard to understand what a new life that you offer is like to us. Thank you for sending Jesus to help us understand and guide us. Send your Holy Spirit so that we can be born again in this new way of life. Amen. And y'all can go downstairs with Miss Julia and Mr. John, I think. And as we join together um, in prayer, we, um, I remind you that in the back of your bulletin, there's a list of um, prayer requests um, that have been given to us, um, as you, if you would like to look over those. Um, we also lift up the shootings over the July 4th weekend um, in multiple cities. Um, are there any other prayer requests that you would like to lift up? All right, let's pray. Wind of God, blow away the tight rules that hold us back from trusting, risking, and loving. Blow away my sins that stand in the way of encountering our neighbors. Ready us for birth, prepare us for risk, and equip us in cur with courage and vision for the new thing that waits around the corner. We cannot choose the stories that we have inherited, but we can choose the stories that we become. We may not always understand the stories that you invite us to, but we walk into them with arms open open and willing to do your work. Send your Holy Spirit, God, that we may be born into this new way of life. We don't want to be left where we are, but we want to continuously be transformed by you, allowing space for you in our lives that your spirit may move within each one of us. Even with the fear of the unknown of what this new life may look like with you, God, comfort us and take us each step of the way with you. God, around us, it feels as though there's turmoil that seems to be never ending. And we don't want to be complacent, so we ask for ways in which we may be able to step up. That you would guide us into places to share your love with those around us. May we be the body of Christ here in this world, within your church and your community. Give us eyes to see your kingdom here on earth, areas and moments that we can share with you. Remind us each day that you are present with us and that we, in all that we do. Show us the ways in which we have grown each year so that we might see the ways in which you are working in and through us. Remind us that you are a God who guides us and who claims us and calls us and loves us as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now if you want to stand and turn to page 576, we're going to sing, Rise Up, O Men of God.
Please be seated. And as at this time, we give thanks for the gifts that God has given us, and we take a moment to offer them back to God.
The Lord be with you. So good to be with you. I'm Dale Clem, and um, I'm just honored to be able to be back at Epworth. I grew up here in this church, and it's always good to come back and see um, familiar friends. I want to share with you scripture today from Luke's gospel, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6. In the 50th year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Iteria and Traconius, and Lysirius ruler of Abilene during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the regions around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins, as is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all f flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Some of you have probably been to the, to the Holy Land, and you know how the Mediterranean Sea has this warm breeze that blows from the sea over through the land and up to the mountain of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is, is on this, this rocky mountain, but the, the warm air, moist air that comes just kind of gets stuck there around Jerusalem when it hits that mountain. And so Jerusalem can... wonder what happened to my mic. Okay. The, uh, it, could, it could have kind of wet weather. It could be snowing in Jerusalem, but the mountains just stop that weather from going any further east. It just like, it's like it squeezes all the moisture out of the air, leaving the, the, the land east of Jerusalem dry and arid and rock. It's just this rocky, um, there's, it's, a, it's a rocky desert kind of environment. So if you were going to walk from Jerusalem down over the, the, that area, that rocky area toward the Dead Sea, on a trail or road, you're just entering a totally different environment. It's tan, it's brown, it's rocky. The walk is not a, a walk in the park with shade trees and sidewalks and duck ponds. It's not like big springs at all. And it was this path, this trail, that people walked some 15 to 18 miles to, down to the Jordan River to see John the Baptist. This, this walk would have been an elevation drop of about 2,500 feet or half a mile. John grew up not far from Jerusalem, we think. And so he would have walked through the city of Jerusalem on his way to the Jordan. So he would have walked this path as well. But a question I want to ask John in the next life is, why did he choose this dry, desolate place for the baptism? Do you know, were there not any streams and ponds in Jerusalem where it's nice, or down toward the Mediterranean, it's much nicer at the sea? Why did he choose this place? Maybe he knew that people needed to have a pilgrimage of such if they were going to come and be baptized and, and repent. Maybe he, they needed to have walked that 15 miles before they were ready to, to be baptized. It gives them time. You know, when we walk, it gives us a chance to shift our attitudes. So often the world is centered around us, right? And, and when we're walking with a religious purpose, it gives us an opportunity to shift our attitude more toward God. When we walk, we slow down and we notice what's along the way. We make friends and we create community. A lot of us will walk three miles an hour. A theologian from Japan said, we have a three mile an hour God. God is not 
moving very fast because the speed of love is very slow. It's a three mile an hour God. So what did they see when they got to the Jordan? They saw John who was dressed in humble clothes. He wore camel hair outfit and a leather belt. Maybe you'd like to dress up like John in Halloween. I don't know. It might be fun. This dress would have reminded the Jews of the prophet Elijah. Second Kings says that Elijah wore hair and a leather belt. And when the Jewish visitors made their way from Jerusalem down to the Jordan to see, what is this guy doing? They, 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 he looked like Elijah. And they said, are you Elijah? He said, no, I am the voice in the wilderness. When Jesus referred to John the Baptist in Matthew 11, he refers to his clothing when he says, why did you go to the Jordan to see? Why did you go to the wilderness to see a man dressed in soft clothing? He was making a jab at the Pharisees and the royals who wore nice, comfortable clothing with fancy belts. In those days, a soft, fancy, woven, braided, or cloth belt was more expensive than leather. I don't know that that would be the case today. But John wore this ordinary, homemade leather belt. The road between Jerusalem and Jericho was dangerous. The road was this setting that Jesus used when he told the story, the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan. You know the story, this, this man was beaten up on the side of the, and left by robbers on the side of the road, the priests, the Levite, those people who wore nice robes like this, they just passed him by. And then this despicable Samaritan came and took care of him, took him to an inn and paid for him to be nursed back to health. I say that because there were many caves along this road from Jerusalem to the Jordan where robbers could be. I was there a few years ago and stopped on that road and to the archaeological remains that they think was an inn, a hostel of some sort. People could stop and on that journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. The scripture says that people from Jerusalem and Judea took this journey on this dangerous, barren, rocky path to hear and see John the Baptist. Why would they come? Why would they walk 15 or 18 miles for, for a religious guy? I suspect that they were longing to get closer to God. They had this desire, this calling, this yearning to get closer, nearer to God. By being close to John the Baptist, maybe that would happen. The journey would not be a one-day trip. It would take several days, I suspect. John's gospel says that John was in, in Bethany across the Jordan. When he saw Jesus, he said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Then the next day, John was standing with Andrew and saw Jesus again about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So according to John's gospel, Jesus stayed at the river at least several days. It would seem probable that other pilgrims stayed several days as well. Going to see John the Baptist was a pilgrimage of sorts. It certainly wasn't a vacation. If they were, if they were tourists, they would have probably gone to the beach. Or I would anyway. But they went through this wilderness, this desert, to see a holy man, maybe to get closer to God, get some clarity for their lives, maybe forgiveness. Pilgrimages are not meant to be easy. It seems as though the obstacles, those losses, the hardships are needed to loosen up our souls so that we can really rely on God and not just ourselves. John told them if they want to get close to God, they needed to repent and change their lives. I bet because they were away from their ordinary lives, they had time to process what happened on their journey, what he said, what it meant for them. They, were, they went down through the water and were washed clean. 
the pilgrims had a new start and could think about it as they walked back to Jerusalem or wherever they came from. On pilgrimages, there's always surprises. Because when you're on pilgrimage, you're, you're open to how God is speaking to you, and you're, you're, you're more open to the Spirit. For Andrew and Simon, according to John's gospel, they came to see John the Baptist, but were surprised when they met Jesus. And meeting Jesus changed their lives. How many times do we think that we're doing one thing? We go to church or we go meet somebody, we go to do one thing and then something else happens and it surprises us. That's what happened to Simon and Andrew. Abraham and Sarah were called to leave their homes on a pilgrimage of sorts. The big surprise for them was on the road, three guests came. They offered them hospitality, they fed them, and then these three guests tell them that they're going to have a child. What a preposterous idea. They're on this pilgrimage, and these guests come and surprise them with this news, and Sarah laughed out loud. And nine months later, they named Isaac. Isaac, which means laughter. The first pilgrims in the New Testament were probably the shepherds and the magi. They traveled in search of the Christ child. The angels told the shepherds, and the kings were following the star. They came from a long distance, looking for this infant king of the Jews, and when they found him, they fell on their knees. They offered gifts. Jesus' life was rooted in pilgrimage. He, they, his family followed the ritual, the Jewish ritual of going to Jerusalem several times a year. Luke's gospel says that when Jesus was young, every year his parents would go to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. So pilgrims, they travel beyond their home, seeking renewal, wisdom, a change of heart. Now tourists go to see new sites to observe and take appreciations of home with them. They go with their comforts, if they can, anyway. But travel for pilgrims is more of a sacred journey. Pilgrims are focusing on their spiritual journey. They're searching for God, a need for the sacred, for beauty, for developing that the religious dimension in their lives. Perhaps they're half pilgrims, half tourists, or I always think I am when I go on a pilgrimage. Pilgrimage are, are pop popular today for Christians. The Catholic Church promotes pilgrimages. In Mexico, every parish in that country has a time scheduled to go near Mexico City to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Maybe you have been there. I was there a number of years ago, and I just couldn't believe the thousands of pilgrims that came to that church every year for blessing and make their pilgrimage. Thousands of years, thousands of Christians go to Omer Amagau, this little village in Germany, to see the Passion Play every 10 years. Because of 2020, the Passion Play was put off until this, this year. It's going on right now. The history is 400 years ago, during the Black Plague, people in the village prayed that, that, that God would protect their village. And so from that moment on, and they said, if, if, if you protect our village, we'll do a play to tell your story. From that promise on, that moment on, nobody died of that disease. And so up until this day, they, this village puts on this play every 10 years. My wife and I were pilgrims there last month, half pilgrim, half tourist, maybe three quarters tourist, one quarter pilgrim. We went to see the Passion Play. I, I wasn't that excited about it, really, to be honest. It was my wife's bucket list thing. But I went, you know, I'm a good sport. I, I wasn't excited because it was in German. My German's not good. How's yours? And it's five, five, five and a half hours long. I thought, I'm going to sit in a seat for that long. Oh, goodness. And um, 
And so, I, I, and I know the story. I know how it's going to end. So I, I thought, I, I'm just not that excited about it. But we went, and, and, and my excitement kind of was, was grew as I got in this village and started talking to people. We went and met a carver, and she, and she said, well, I got to close shop because I got to go be in the play. Okay. I met these other people in the street. They're, they're just at their shops. And we say, well, are you in the play? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be done. We had to get people from the other villages to come run the restaurant so we can go do the show. And, I, and, and then we got to the theater early because you got to go through the, you know, the metal detectors and everything. And I'm just out there waiting to go in for the theater to open. And all, I'm just watching all the, the villagers ride their bicycles. And they're just normal people, all these kids, they're just coming in. Because to be in the Passion Play, you've got to lived in, have lived in the village for 20 years or be born there. And, and, and I, they're just normal people like y'all doing a Passion Play. And so they're just all riding their bikes up there. We, the doors open, we go in. And I was just amazed. I was blown away. I loved it. I just loved it. I thought it was so cool that these normal people... We're putting on the story of Jesus for the world as a promise that they had made to God. The costumes, the characters, they, they seemed contemporary in the script. I, I, of course, it was in German, but I'm reading along in my English script. One of the things that they, they did was, um, well, they had a camel. Camels, when King Herod came on, they had these camels. And, you know, that's interesting, too, to have these camels on stage. One was, was behaved well and one didn't. And that was a lot of fun to watch. And it's like you could just have this commentary. I told you I didn't want to come in. This. I told you I had to go to the bathroom. And then he went. <laughs> that was fun, too, because the chorus and other actors, they just moved, moved, kind of formed a line and then another guy in costume just came with the scoop and stuff and cleaned it up as if this was on cue. It was great. They had doves that came in, and then at the in the in the Palm Sunday procession, they let the doves out and they and they flew around the audience. We don't do that enough in church. They flew around and then they flew out and. I, they didn't let the chickens out, though. I bet they couldn't got the chickens back in. But it was great. I just loved it. It was just fun. It was fresh. When it got to the story of the betrayal of Jesus, and Peter had betrayed Jesus, and Judas had betrayed Judas, Jesus, and, and, and Peter is just feeling terrible about himself, and he just wants to quit and give up. And John, the disciple John, says, G G Peter, you know Jesus is going to forgive you. Jesus is love. God is love. Jesus will forgive you. And so Peter is brought back into the fold. And then there's Judas. And he's just feeling so bad. He felt in, in this presentation, he got tricked. He was betrayed himself. It wasn't his fault. He was a victim. I like this story. And then Judas had no John there to tell him, Jesus will forgive you. And so Judas ends up taking his own life. Don't we need that story today? We need Johns in our lives who will convince us when we're down and de de depressed and we've messed up and we don't know about going on. Jesus is love. Jesus is going to forgive you. Maybe you and I can be Johns for somebody. When it was over, it's like two and a half hours in the afternoon, then you have a two and a half hour break to go eat dinner, which is really nice. Then you come back for the last two and a half hours. Kids aren't in the second half. They've ridden their bicycles home. And it, you know, for that dinner break, all the villagers, they just ride their bikes home, eat dinner, they come back. It's great. When it was over, I was just so moved. My faith was renewed like everybody else's. That's one pilgrim, pilgrimage that's worthwhile. Thousands of pilgrims walk the Camino de Santiago in northern Spain each year. Some walk 500 miles, some only walk 100 miles. The goal and destination is this church 
where supposedly the bones and of St. John James the Apostle are kept. The, the picture of that church is on the front of your bulletin. You'll notice that it's very fancy. It's a very fancy church. To be there in that church with those bones helps you, pilgrims think, to be closer to the apostle himself. Many healings have occurred there over the years. Our family, a few years ago, walked 200 miles of this pilgrimage my, my kids were teenagers. I know you, that you know that they loved it. It was a forced march. It was hot. It was hard. We had to get up before dawn and start mark, mark, walking while it was cold. I mean, hot, cooler than the hot heat of the day. We had to carry everything we needed in backpacks, so we practiced living simply. We wore a shell, the sign of the pilgrim. And we stopped at churches along the way for prayers. When you walk, you slow down. You have to give up instant gratification because the destination is weeks away. For us, we didn't have cell phones. Well, we thought our daughter didn't anyway. So you can't check social media or emails. You have to detach. That's what pilgrims do. You detach from home so you can concentrate on God. We passed through towns and villages, stayed in hostels where we enjoyed mostly visiting with other pilgrims. We were one of the only Americans that we met there of the hundreds and hundreds of, of pilgrimages, pilgrims. We were tempted to quit. I was moved to watch a family day after day push their family member in a wheelchair over these rocks through these roads. He was paralyzed somehow, and he was so eager to make this pilgrimage. I don't know if he was into wanting healing or what, but there was the love that this family showed to push their loved one hundreds of miles to get to this church. At the top of one mountain we had climbed called Osobrero, one of the tallest mountains. One of our daughters felt sick. So I checked in at the, the city bus station. When is the next bus coming? And they said, oh, it's a couple days. Okay. What do we do? Well, we could stay at a hotel. Maybe if we could find one here in this little village, we can... So we just kept walking a little bit, and I found that there was a parking lot, and there was this little short bus with pilgrims who were English-speaking, which was critical for me. Um, and uh, I, I said, would y'all mind um, taking our daughters who are, don't feel good to the next village? They don't want to walk anymore. And they, and they said, oh, sure. The guy said, this is what we do. We help pilgrims. So they got on the bus. My wife and I walked with the rest of the pilgrims that were going to be on that bus to the next village. God will provide. When you're on pilgrimage, you learn to rely on God. On this pilgrimage, we had obstacles. We had lost luggage. We had blisters, sore muscles. And of course, those inner burdens that we all carry, those Secret burdens were symbolized for us in a rock. We carried this rock with us. And then at the appropriate time, we, we, we let that rock go. There's big piles of rocks there at certain places. And you just let that burden go. Give it over to God. We were, we were surprised at one point to meet a man. He was just by a dilapidated barn. And he had a little kiosk. And when, when he walked up, he, he jumped up so excited to greet us and Say, would you like some fresh squeezed orange juice? And he got oranges and he squeezed us orange juice and had a little ice that he put in it. And it was such a hot day. What a treat that was. And I tried to pay him and he just laughed. He said, no, God provides. This is, this is God's love for you. When we finally made it to Santiago. I was surprised to see a seminary professor I knew. 
in line, and I, I went and talked to him, and we had a good visit talking about this pilgrimage. Inside the, the church, the, the priest spoke first to those in Spanish, and then to us pilgrimage, pilgrims in several languages, including English. This cathedral has a large metal incense holder called the Butafumiro, which in Galatian means smoke expeller. This, uh, this Butafumiro is, is suspended from the, the top of the dome on this big rope that was installed in 1604. It's been there a while and it's huge. It takes eight people to pull this up and they're dressed in red. And, and, and the, so, so at the appropriate time in the service, what we're all waiting for is the swinging of this smoke um, thing and, and, and this incense thing. And so they, they lift it up and they start swinging it back and forth over this whole cathedral and it's just marvelous. And it's puffing out all this smoke and it symbolizes how our prayers have been reaching to God. I think all of us cried a little bit out of celebration and relief. We had made it. God was there. It's a good thing, even for a few weeks, to put your life into the hands of God. Maybe you're like me and you have felt a call, a desire, a longing to get your faith out of your head and into your body. I think in Protestantism, sometimes we become this religion of right answers and words, and we emphasize belief more than faith. However, faith is an event. It's an experience of the Holy Spirit. Pilgrimage gives us to experience, gives us the chance to practice our faith as an event. Perhaps you've had a desire to go on some kind of pilgrimage going to the Holy Land. I'm taking a group in November if anybody wants to go. Maybe you'd like to go to the Passion Play in America in Eureka Springs at Branson. Maybe a pilgrimage for you would be the Civil Rights Trail. God speaks to us in surprising ways. Along the Camino every day, Anytime you meet someone, you always say, Buen Camino, good, good, good travel, good journey, good hike. Buen Camino, you say it dozens of times every day. Buen Camino. It's kind of the same thing as we say in church when we pass the peace, the peace of Christ. Be with you. Peace be with you. It's a blessing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if in our everyday lives we meet strangers and we just say a special prayer, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. There's something that in us that changes, and they can tell if we just say, peace be with you, quietly to ourselves. When Muslims conquered Spain in the 8th century, there were some Christians that remained there, and they adopted the the, the Arabic language and the culture, and they continue to practice their Christian faith. Can you imagine being in a country that's taken over by another country and they change the language? That you, you have to learn a new language. At my age, I would be a disaster. But that's what these Christians did in, in Spain. And from that Christian community, they wrote this prayer that I want to offer as our, our closing prayer, which is the essence of what it means to be on pilgrimage. Let us pray. Oh God, you call us from our settled ways, out of old habits and rutted traditions. You call us into the land of promise, to new life and new possibilities. Make us strong to travel the road ahead. Deliver us from false security and comfort, desire for ease and uninvolved days. Let your word and spirit dwell in us, that your will may be fulfilled in us for the well-being and shalom of all. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Open My Eyes That I May See, number 454.
I invite you to stand as we sing it together. of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine divine. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, I will to receive. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children us to share. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to receive. Open my heart, illumine me, Spirit divine. And now may we leave this place filled with the Holy Spirit, and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.